Hello, welcome to the On Labs podcast. This is Bill Kennedy, and today our special guest is Sarah Murphy. Hey, Sarah, thanks for joining us today. Hi, uh, greetings, Bill. How are you doing today? So far, so good. T- tell everybody uh, where you're coming from. I am in San Mateo, California, just south of San Francisco, uh, and basically in Silicon Valley. Uh, been in this area for, geez, a little over 15 years, how time flies. Are you experiencing all the uh, smoke from all the fires out there too? Occasionally, there is, uh, right now there's a, a, like it was a little hazy this morning, we'll see what happens, but mostly there's, uh, last month or so, there's been um, kind of a onshore breeze, and so the rest of the country gets to see what happens when an area the size that half the state of Rhode Island is on fire, right? So uh, in previous years, we have had it bad enough with like significant ash fall and things like that. But um, as everyone's discovering, it's just where the wind blows. Yeah, I, I had a house for a long time on the edge of the Everglades. And then, you know, every once in a while, there'd be a fire out there because of lightning or something. And you'd wake up the next morning and your car's filled with ash. So I've kind of I've experienced it a little bit, but like you get that for a day or two, like not for a month. <laughs> well, um, what can what can one say? Even in the last years, there's been uh, some things that are noticeable, right? This is our our world now, um, and now we're hoping that it's not going to get worse and trying to do what we can. Um, the uh, yeah, what can I say? Like when I, moved, when I moved here, people were legitimately like, "Oh, San Jose area is like." No, there's no need for air conditioning. Never no, I've been a problem to be like, if anybody tells you that now, they're lying. <laughs> All right. Give everybody the two minute sort of um, two minute background on what you're doing today. Uh, sure. Well, right now I am working for WePay, which is a credit card processing subsidiary of Chase. Um, and I work as a senior staff site re- reliability engineer, but basically I worry about things. Um, I'm trying to up-level a team and uh, set up some procedures so that everything works <laughs> and does so without, uh, let's say, heroic engineering. So we're not dependent on, uh, you know, people doing massive on-call hours or literally just, uh, you know, making sure their fingers hovering over the button that says go or stop, right? So yeah, there's a lot of components to that that I'm happy to talk about, but that's what I'm up to now. I, I did definitely want to talk about this at some point because I, I've heard this term site reliability sure. uh, engineering for for 10 years. And I, I'm not 100 percent sure if that means like you're just dealing with production. And I'm really curious how developers are involved in that. But let's get to that kind of later because I, I'm, I'm super interested in that. This podcast is really about you and your journey to be where you are today. And I and. People are, I know people are going to relate to your story, and that's really what this podcast is about. So okay. it's kind of, and we got about an hour or so to, to do that, which is not a lot of time. <laughs> but let's, um, let's jump in. My, I'm going to ask you my favorite first question. Okay. Go back in the time machine, and what's the very first sort of thought that pops in your head when you think about working on a computer? Please, back in the time machine... First thought that so so is this like the, the first time I worked with a computer or just it could be you played with a computer you worked with a computer the, the first time you can think about a computer in your life I think a computer for me like first time certainly first time playing with a computer was like the excitement of getting it to do something you asked it to right or I asked it to and so the first computer that I had. Um, it, it was almost, uh, I believe that was like a family Christmas present when I was young. And so now, now I'm really greetings everyone. I'm old. Um, I'm going to date myself by saying that, you know, the model, which was a, uh, Timex Sinclair 2068, which was Timex. a, yeah, a, um, not particularly successful, although I, I don't know how one fully judges that, um, consumer plug into your television computer. Um, probably around 19, I want to say like 1983, 84, let's say. Yeah, I'm with you there. That was my first computer too. It was plug into the TV and you had your tape recorder yeah. next to it so you could load and save your programs. Wow. So what, so I'm, I am going to, I have, unfortunately in the show, we have to date everybody. So what year did you graduate high school? 
I graduated high school in 1992. 92. Okay. So we've got, so you really were very young then. Oh yeah. Yeah. When you started with that. I remember that, mach at least the machine I had came with basic, like that was the first thing I did. I just started writing basic programs. It came. It came with a little manual, and uh, for those unfamiliar with this, or you want to want to look it up, uh, <laughs> little, yeah, talk about Time Machine. It came with St uh, Sinclair Super Basic, I think. And so Super Basic was one where it was like very much like Basic, but as a, a series of keywords, which were actually written on the keys of the keyboard, and using a series of function and shift keys, you could go like circle, you know, things like that, or it had particular things to, uh, particularly uh, graphics and some math functions were built in. I think uh, recently I looked up some stuff about the Sinclair system, and this is also like, imagine a production system if you open it up, and then like you're gonna find like a whole bunch of like chips cross rigged, right? Like the individual patches between them. That's what how they shipped, right? So it is this little, um, look nice on the outside, kind of hacked together. But it was neat to be able to do as a kid to just go, oh, all right, uh, make a circle of this dimension and draw it in color on the screen. And that was that was pretty neat, right? And so, yeah, doing it, doing these kind of things without, you know, I guess having to do all the math because it had essentially um, modules, right? The, the, you know. And now it would be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna import a graphic module and just do it. But this is on the keyboard, so it's so much better, right? Your memory is amazing. Like, I think I'm gonna be like 90 years old and not even remember I was alive at some point. Because <laughs> I don't, I don't remember any level of that detail. But that's that's awesome. So that means that you had to be probably in elementary school at the time that's happening. Yeah, it, it was. Yeah, I'd have to ask my uh, my mom like what the impetus for the purchase was, because um, I don't. You know, I don't think that it was largely like a, one of those things where it's like, oh, and then, you know, we'll use it for everything and it's all this accounting or all this other stuff, right? And of course, there's no publicly available internet that we were going to connect to, so much less useful than a computer that family would have in, say, the early 90s or mid 90s to connect to America Online or whatever those services. And so I don't know, you know, my, my family did not have a tremendous amount of uh, disposable income when I was growing up. And so, uh, for all I know, it might have, might have just been like, yeah, here's an enrichment activity, and it was reasonably priced for the time because you're plugging it into your television. I think it was because my family didn't really have disposable income, and I remember them. I think they got it at like Radio Shack. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like. I it. must have been like thirty, forty bucks or something. Like I don't know what it was, but it had to have been in that price range for them to just come home and go here. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was something, right? Um, and this is also, you know, it's just, uh, I think at one point I had like a flea market black and white television attached to it or it, you know, it's just like, you know, this is, yeah, here, here's the, here's the tale of my journey is that the stuff that I read about when I was 16 and Neuromancer, I basically kind of helped make happen. So enjoy the world, everybody. Uh, enjoy your cyberpunk dystopia. <laughs> The black and white TV. I remember when I was able to have my own black and white TV in my room because they upgraded the TV. It was like the greatest moment of my life, right? With the TV antenna, by the way, because, you know, we didn't have cable yet. Made yeah, that antenna course. work in the basement. <laughs> uh, now, now I'm sitting in front of, like, multiple screens or whatever, and then <laughs> everyone who uh, is entering, let's say everyone who's entering this industry now probably had, like, their own laptop or their own computer and like six televisions and you know their watch has more processing power than the space shuttle did in 1982 or so you know things like that so uh good times right i i, I remember in the 80s this kind of we were laughing a little bit in the 80s about this idea of being able to have video on demand at the time sure right? because you had the push button remotes that had a big wire and and that was brilliant but now, like today, I think back about how everything's like, I don't have cable anymore. It's all video on demand. I just, I want to watch this. I can find it, right? My dad, even up until the time he passed away in his 80s, thought the internet and the laptop was just mind-blowing to him. He could get any piece of information he wanted at any time. And he used to say it to me like this was mind-blowing, right? So Yeah. Yeah. My, my dad just, had the same. I gave him a, uh, at one point, I gave him a second-hand iPad. 
right? And I was like, here you go. And it's oh, what? and then he's like, wait a second, I can like look up anything. And I'm like, <laughs> go crazy, dad. Yeah. Okay, so let's get back. So that's kind of your first memory, which is really amazing because that's that's early on. And I I imagine that you basically tapped that computer out fairly quickly. You know, you know, one of the things is like, it's available, but then when you think of like a, a kid c coding, it's like you can do certain things. I think later I also, um, there was a single, uh, you know, TSR-80 in the gifted class that I was in when I was growing up. So this is elementary school. And uh, so it's like between the two, I could do some limited basic programming. And I think a friend or two uh, were also working on this kind of stuff. Teaching yourself this when you're very young is, of course, super difficult. And like, I can be smart, but I'm not like, no, I didn't like write a whole bunch of insane, crazy programs. It was more like, well, write simple things, get the computer to accept input, you know, the basic kind of like, what is your name? That's where people usually start and, and put it on the screen and all such stuff. So yeah, I mean, that was, it was just something that was around, but also one of the things about my journey or the times that I, I have lived through it's also that like the economy has grown up around this while um, I, you know, while I've been living. So there, there's times, um, I guess we'll get that to that later. It's like, you know, I left college and I used it when I was in college, I was writing uh, some of the early generation of uh, internet text-based games. And I left college, like I was writing like really, <laughs> <laughs> crappy and buggy C programming and other internal languages. But when I dropped out of college, like there was nothing to do with that for years. Yeah, don't, yeah, I don't want you to get too far ahead. ahead yeah, all right. Yeah, I'm going to, I want to talk a little bit more about high school before we, oh, okay, before sure. we get there. But I'm curious if you ever walked into a department store that had the computers there unlocked and ever wrote a very quick basic program just so it would flash whatever message you wanted. <laughs> I, 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 I wish I had, I did not. I, was, <laughs> I don't think I was particularly, um, I was not like a little uh, little hacker kid, right? I don't I don't know, I don't, there's, there's some things where I was um, just very much like, kind of like mm, in my own world, I think as I was a kid for a lot of reasons. And so uh, I did plenty of nerdy things, but not that. Oh, I, I, anytime I saw a DOS machine at that time and I could get to the command prompt, it was game over in the department store. I were just horrible messages just repeating over oh. and over. <laughs> well, that sounds good. There you go. <laughs> and there nobody in the store knew how to stop it, which was the best thing, you know. So you'd walk away and you'd just like peek behind one of the, I don't know, something and just wait for one of the employees to like freak out <laughs> until they shut it off. All right, let's let's talk about high school a little bit because when you're when you're entering high school, what kind of things are you are you interested in? Are you are you interested in in, in the computer side of things? Or what else are you doing? High school just sucked for me. Right? It just is just terrible. You know, so what do I think I'm going to be doing? I have no idea. Like I think I spent a lot of my time like at some point just kind of like playing basketball. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then just going to school. I think what most interested me in high school as far as an academic subject was chemistry. So I think early on, I thought I was going to be like a chemist or go to college with chemistry, which I did for you know a year or two. I did take a uh, computer math class, which was just like a very, it was exactly what it sounded. It was largely like a math class. I happened to have writing short programs to solve math problems or interacting with quote industry kind of things in that the like, oh, well, here's what a database is. Here's what, you know, a spreadsheet is kind of thing. I, I, I went to a, a public school in the American sense and so not the British sense, like just a, a, a school for like a pretty much working class community in Rhode Island. This it was more of like, Oh, great. You know, you'll, this is a class where you can, it's a step above data entry kind of thing. Right. So in that class, we like, I had a friend in, uh, in that class who, who also had a, you know, he had a computer at home. And so he would also like, we would do all our work and then play games on the computer. So IBM PC. Right? So what was it about chemistry that you, that you enjoyed? Cause I remember that being such a hard class for me. I don't know. It seemed complex and I was good at it. I, I, I can't really state, you know, and then also like, things really, you know, you could figure out why things happened in the real world. So that that was appealing at the time. Were you doing any sort of chemistry 
experiments at home with, with things because I had a couple friends that went to chemistry. I remember them taking some materials out of the lab one day at home and they were causing some bad things to happen at home. <laughs> I think at one point I had like a little junior chemistry set when I was a kid, like one summer, and I did some of the experiments in it. But this was probably right at that inflection point where it's all kind of like, oh, we probably shouldn't give kids a whole bunch of potassium, right? <laughs> or things that they, they can't eat or, and I'm now, now I'm sure, I don't know what you do. I think you like play with like Play-Doh or something, right? Like, <laughs> like it's more of like a kitchen than it is like a chemistry set. So uh, that was on the tail end of like, oh, hey, you know what? We're not going to give anything that's going to be like able, you combine two things and it's going to produce like a strong acid, strong base, poison or an explosive, right? So um yeah, there, I remember that one. I was trying to actually get into a uh, more difficult chemistry class, but I did later. And I had the uh, little time warp thing. I think the teacher was like, well, do you even have a chemistry set at home? And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> how, how, where would I put it? How would I have it? You know, like it's just kind of one of those things, right? Nice. All right. So, so as you're finishing up high school, um, you're thinking about chemistry as a are, are you thinking like like you're going to be a teacher or you want to do ceramical engineering or? you know I, I i had really had not much concept about it um so i graduated high school when i was 17 i didn't really want to go to college i only applied to a couple places i did you know look around and got in got into those two places and then like um yeah i was just gonna gonna check it out right yeah, because I'm, I'm really at that time, there was a lot of pressure on everybody to have to go to university next. I, and I don't know why, right? Trade schools were fine. And there's still fine options today. But I, I, I remember being pressured, like, you have to go to university. I think, I think my, uh, my family is more like you have to do something. Right? <laughs> so it's like, of course, they would have preferred me to go to university. Um, uh, yeah, so what happened with that is I, I went to University of California. Uh, Irvine took a, a, like my high school chemistry experience had been rigorous enough where it's just kind of like, I just snoozed through the first two semesters really, or two trimesters of chemistry um, because it was the same material, right? So I just crushed that. Um, I, the next year I got into organic chemistry. I did it for majors and I had a lab, which was like eight hours on a Saturday. And then after doing that for a few weeks, I was like, this is not something I actually want to do anymore. <laughs> Like, as, oh like, I could not imagine it as a job. But then again, that's I'm sure that's not really like what most chemistry is like, but it was enough to just put me off. And then I was gonna, uh, I was gonna write, actually, I was gonna do uh, much more interested in like literature and history and politics at that point. Uh, I was gonna focus on that. But but yeah, after after my uh, sophomore year, I, I ended up dropping out and in between. So here's like the juicy computing part. So a few years into my first, my freshman year at college, I got access to like the internet that we know, right? So it's like, oh, there's log into the mainframe, get, you know, have your own email account, uh, be able to uh, have terminals, you know, so why is he terminals for those who haven't seen it? Like very much glow, like don't leave them on too long. They'll burn in, right? A lot of orange. <laughs> You might get a can from that much, much radiation, and um, but you could tell that. Yeah. So you could go to other resources, and so to set the stage for for anyone who's like younger than you know the rocks and the hills, that uh, it's more like this is pre-web. So um, HTTP as a protocol is like being developed or being pondered <laughs> at CERN uh, by Tim Berners Lee. And there aren't web browsers yet. The first year, there's no web browsers. So the what do you use is things like Gopher, which is an internet directory of a sort, right, to remote things. But uh, I was playing games using Telnet because I ran into a bunch of friends who were playing games. And then I went, why don't we just run a game? And so then I spent time, like, 60-plus hours a week designing and running games instead of going to classes. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you stopped going to classes. When you're building a, a Telnet kind of game, I mean, you, you're doing you're doing protocol work too there. I mean, because you got to, right? I mean, that's just a socket connection at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, it? yeah. It, it's a very simple socket connection. I did not write that code. 
right? So these are based on, here's the beginning of like some open source stuff because you could get the main package uh, for MUD or MUSH code uh, just as a download, right? Um, what I found was interesting was this is also like, man, it's been a while. Anyway, but <laughs> uh, the, the part about this is um, there's no like YouTube to go learn how to use Unix. You could barely find a book in the library about that. I had to ask like hassle people, how do you do this? Oh, there's a man page. I'm like printing out manuals on a dot matrix line printer because it was free and have this big stack of like green bar. So remember, so if anybody's listening to this for their screenplay, you can put all these terms in your next like hacker throwback movie. <laughs> so, you know, if there's another Alton Catch Fire, assign, you know, so it's all this kind of stuff where it's like, wait a second. Um, you know, how, what can I get for free or what can I pay a penny a page for, right? And then have to go through this, which is just something like I, I have tech books, but I don't sit around reading a man page for something. I just assume that it's going to be there when I need it. So yeah, having to learn Unix, I wrote a lot. It was the introduction of things like... But you're writing this in C, right? And then you're hosting it on the school mainframe? I was. I actually found somebody who had an extra Sun pizza box that had four megabytes of memory plugged into the internet in the wall in, in one of the research labs. So you were running it on that? Yeah, it was just like, oh yeah, I have something to spare. <clears throat> um, why don't, you know, here's access to this like junk box we just have plugged into the internet. And here's an IP address, go. Yep, pretty much. Imagine, like, like you'll never get that again today. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's A, not much computing resource, but the idea that you're having like a institutional um, namespace server just plug in that you're going to open ports on. Yeah, it's just <laughs> like, yeah. good luck with that, right? Um, I'm just running, I'm just running a game. Um, you know, now, of course, whatever, people would be like, well, I took over the school's machine, and now it mines Ethereum for me, and, you know, we're great, you know. So how did you let people know about your game, or was it just like a, a core group of friends? So local plus Usenet, right? So I had several friends who were also like co-administrators. And let me explain the, the size of a game <laughs> at that time. What did the game do too? Tell, tell me also what the, sure. what the game did. So the, the, the most popular ones that, ones that I ran were uh, MUDs. So multi-user dungeon. So it is a, um, these would be pick your setting and you're doing basically uh, uh, PVE and PVP combat, all text right? Walking through the world, it's all text. And then you say like, go attack monster or cast fireball or something like that. And then it does it. There's like ticks for timing so you can't just spam it, right? Uh, and, you know, up arrow all the time and you collect loot. So these would be very much like uh, an MMO, right? And so the idea of the scale of this one being a four megabyte box that you're opening up multiple socket connections on, um, you can only have so many. <laughs> um, and also a success, I think the most successful we were was we had 50 consec, you know, 50 users online at the same time. That's not bad. Yeah. What's wrong with that? It's not. It was pretty, I mean, this, so once again, this is circa 1993, right? We were like, oh yeah, there were games that had, <clears throat> were, um, maybe around a hundred users, but that's as big as it got for consecutive users. I think for ones that I saw um of this type there were just a lot of these games there are hundreds of them operating at a time um ran that for oh geez i was at least you know it continued after i left school it was up for years the school never knew that did the school know i, I guess the bandwidth was so small like you were able to stay hidden but yeah was, you would think somebody would say what's what's all these traffic nope. going on to this pizza box why why because I mean, I guess you'd have to monitor it at like a larger level, but the end of it, there was no processes or nothing was running on the other machine. Yeah, it's interesting. It was just like a junk machine that all they have to do is like unplug it or something. So it was literally just something like, I got this in a rack in a closet, it doesn't matter, right? The guy just, just let it. And to be honest, the larger bandwidth use at Irvine at that time would have been uh, NetTrek, which was, uh, so Ted Hadley, who was one of the original um, co-implementers of that game, uh, that was a graphical Star Trek shoot-em-up 
right? With tiny little eight bit chips, right? Like, or 16 bit chips. That was much, that was more popular, but also only had like so many people at a time in a game and things like that, right? So yeah, it was, it was a thing. Um, if you trace it back and you kind of use Moore's law and figure doubling of the number of users, like you go all the way back then, then you're like, oh yeah, now we have games that have tens of millions of people on it at the time. Like, yeah, it's the same kind of doubling. Oddly, let me, no, it's not, I don't want to take credit for this because it's certain, but oddly enough, um, yeah, I had friends at the time who went down and, uh, hung out at, uh, another, you know, next few years, hung out at a small, a startup company that was also doing games that was down the street and hung out and did like land parties there and whatever. And uh, that game, that, that, uh, that, that was Blizzard, right? It was down the street oh, and, nice. and Riverpine. Uh, and so uh, uh, one of my friends firmly believes that, uh, or one of my former friends firmly believes that like, um, yeah, what our most popular character was like a Minotaur Death Knight. So he wants to take credit for the Tauren Death Knight in World of Warcraft. He's just kind of like, come on. That's mine. <laughs> so it was interesting how that worked out. All right, so you you drop out of university because you're essentially programming these games and working on these games. So what happens now after you leave? You have a plan before you leave, or you just leave ah! and you're like... Ah! I didn't drop out because I was playing games. I was dropping out because life sucked. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, trouble, troubled Sarah. Yes. Um, I dropped out cause I, I just, there, there was no point in me being there anymore. Um, and so, uh, yes, yeah, so this is what I kind of alluded to earlier is, um, there is no, um, the web and, and computing industry is not like grown up yet. Right. So I want you, you know, for everybody who, you know, thinks about it now, you dropped out of university and you even know where to put the semicolon in C or how to use Unix, you're probably gonna have some kind of job, right? It's not like your folks are gonna be like, oh, that's it, you know, it's completely, you know, what, whatever's happening. Um, but in uh, at the time, it's like, yeah, as, as you said, um, there's a big drive to have, to, if you're gonna do this kind of work, to have a college degree. I, you can't interview for these jobs. It, you know, there, there's no great, you know, programming, whatever. There are not people uh, dropping out of university to form companies or all this other stuff. So I spent a few years, like kind of like a few years in the wilderness, right? Uh, doing various things, some computational, some not, just trying to like, you know, hold, hold, uh, hold things together and grow up a uh, different story. Uh, but um, yeah, th this is... Uh, yeah, this is like 94 now, right? 94. This is like 94, 95. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like 94 through 98, really, I'm dealing with my own problems and then also like trying to figure out how to make a living. Um, one of the things I was doing at that time, at that one point, I have a job where I'm working in the business office of a hotel, like as the front desk receptionist. And um, I spent my time sitting there like it was boring. You know, there's nothing to do. Um, and sitting there like reading Novell netware ma manuals, which later got me a job. You know, this is like I'm basically kind of like stealing everything I can in terms of knowledge. Did you ever get your CNE? Did you ever go after your CNE for Novell? I did not do the Novell one. Um, you know, around 2000, I had like a... a uh, just wallet full of certifications because that was like certification time, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't do CNE. I later did some a job, a contract job that involved Novell administration. But you know, it started to like turn the corner where <laughs> it was less and less popular at that point. Yeah, I got my CNE like in '94. There you go. And then I never used it. I went right into like pure. I decided in 94 that I didn't want to be in IT because when things broke, you needed hardware and you couldn't get hardware. And it was so stressful. Mm. I was like, I'm done with this. Why should I deal with a situation where I can't fix it right away and everybody's pounding me? If I write software, I can fix it because it's my own problem, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So you're taking that time between 94 and 98, basically four years working like in this one case, this hotel where you're using all of that free time to, to learn, 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 learn. I, I, that, that would be a, a nice version of it. But yeah, I mean, there's this kind of, a lot, lot, largely I was just trying to figure out how to stay alive, 
to be honest, right? And and uh, there's lo like losses I suffered and things like that. So it's just kind of like basically me trying to figure out like how to grow up <laughs> and and how to like live in the world as I could at that time. But you you get through that time, so you you kind of figure it out. And then around '98, you're saying that you get this job. Oh no! Well, '98, I end up getting a job where I am teaching A plus classes. Remind me what A plus is again. A plus is a uh, computer hardware certificate, like how to be a PC technician, right? Uh, I think that was, I don't know, they still exist or it's still CompTIA or whatever. So it's like A plus, network plus, I think they added security plus and things like that. So these are like base, cert this one is particularly a base certification to be a PC tech, tech at some place like uh, Best Buy or something at the time, right? So 1998 is like, we're starting to get the beginning of the first bubble, right? So there is a web and then they have start having these companies in Silicon Valley, I'm down in Southern California, but like, yeah, and then later also went to central Pennsylvania where word is out that there's money in this. And so I was assisting with the retraining really, right? So I'm an instructor. I don't know much, I'm, I'm young. Uh, yeah, how do you get this job as an instructor? Because it's the bubble, right? So, hey, so you're just like, I'm interested. I passed an interview. I knew enough about computer hardware and PC stuff, and they needed someone to teach this for cheap. When you applied for this, were you like hesitant? Were you, you're like, no, I got this? I think I was working in sales at like a, a audio, audio store or something like that. So like... Um, the good guys, a collapsed chain in Southern California, right? So at the, at the time, and I was like, I need a better job. And, uh, you know, so, wow. Talk, so we used to flip through newspapers, <laughs> these kind of things. And there just happened to be one in the, you know, in uh, Long Beach where I was living at the time. Oh my God, it's forever ago. Greetings. You apply for this job, you get the job. You must be excited that you got this job. No, right? It was good. So the, the, you know, one, there's a giant playground of hardware to put together, right? Because there's computers for a dozen students to put together. I enjoyed teaching. It was a rigorous uh, teaching. I'm kind of like also writing part of the curriculum at the same time, whether it's like quizzes or other things. I wrote a computer program in Visual Basic that mirror, you know, so I wrote a uh, test simulator in Visual Basic um, that class used. So that was cool. And at the time, I was learning everything I could because it was like, they had uh, the Microsoft developer license. So they had all these materials. And uh, at one point I ended up taking one MCSC class a week, like a, a test a week. And so after like seven or eight weeks, all of a sudden I had an MCSE, right? Wow. So what else? They wanted to add a networking component. So I figured that out and then got a CCNA because we had like two 1501 routers that we were going to get to talk to each you, other. It sounds like you found your thing at this point, like, and you're, you're, you're happy. You're now passionate about this stuff. You're, you're learning. Yeah. I, I like learning things and, um, things like, you know, natural languages. Uh, I, I'm just a huge nerd. Right. Um, and so, yeah, this, this, this was once again, like now the economy has grown up a little bit and I can take advantage of what knowledge work is available. They paying you decently, like, like you feeling like you got a, a big rate, or you're doing all this with the idea that the next thing's gonna. They pay. So this, I think, this was my first or one of my first salaried jobs. So this is circa 1988, 19, sorry, 1998, 1999. I think the starting salary was about thirty three thousand dollars. That's pretty good. That was enough for a young person. Like that was pretty good. Yeah, I was kind of almost like walking off the street, saying like. Hi, I can speak intelligibly and I'll learn whatever you have quickly. How much were students paying for your classes? You know, that, that I'm not. So one, it was a partially a, a retraining, right? So people would co could come in for this three month class. So think this is like a like, yeah, um, it's like like a imagine a PC tech boot camp, but half the students or two thirds of the students um, are getting their training paid for by the state. So these would also be people who are like, oh. they were unemployed and it's state retraining through basically our school at the time. Okay, okay, okay. It was an interesting thing. And some of my former instructors at that company had been through the program successfully. Like they'd been through it, they worked in tech, then they came back because they want, were interested in teaching. But it was also stuff like, yeah, there are folks who 
you know, um, hopefully, it, you know, help people <laughs> help people out. Some people did get other jobs, but you could be retraining like, well, I used to run a forklift. You know, I'm not interested in that anymore. What can I do kind of thing? And this is before the 2000 crash, right? Where it's suddenly like all these schools blow away, right? I know what's going to happen as soon as there's a slight downtick in tech now to the boot camps. Sorry, sorry, gang. Yeah. So is that what happens? Like, you're, how long are you there for then? Two years? A couple of years. Yeah. A couple of years. So now it's like around 2000. That that company folds up, and then what happens? I think they actually they they ended up quote pivoting to doing medical transcription. Uh, after that, that's a big pivot. <laughs> well, I think it involves both involves keyboards and desks, right? Yeah, Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. Whatever. So then, what do you do after that? Because you're not. I mean, you're not interested in medical transcribing it or even maintaining that system. Woo! Yeah, no, I was. Not, I I had left that that company by then, right? Uh, I, I like led a uh, uh, spearheaded them building out something. I was working in central Pennsylvania. It was a program attached to Penn State there uh, in Harrisburg. Uh, same program, except it was expanded. Like there was actually like a web programming class. And I taught that that was on. Uh, so you moved to Pennsylvania then? Yeah, for a short time. So how do you find that job again? The same company. They were trying a new location. Ah, so you moved up. Okay. But when do you do that? In night? You did do that in 98? Or you did that in... It's like 99, early 2000. How did you like Pennsylvania? It's a big shift now for you. From... I found it super dull. I hung out in the Penn State Library a lot. So you do that for a couple more years, but now you're learning web tech there and you're teaching web tech. So I designed a class that was using ASP, basic kind of things. And then and then like a little mixture of like, I'm like self-teaching as well as like writing the curricula. Um, man, that was... I had days when I had 12 hours of lecture a day because I'm teaching both a intro class, like a computer tech A plus class, as well as that class some days. And that, yeah, it was, it was a lot of work. It's exhausting. No, no. Yeah. It's exhausting. No, for sure. Like sitting, sitting at home with one of the desktop machines, like writing code for the next week's class, you know, it was just like, oh. Yeah. Cause you're learning on the fly too. Yeah. Yeah. You, you knew that material inside and out yeah. by doing that because when you have to teach, you can't, I mean, you have to have another level of knowledge about it. As you well know, I, I, uh, I have this in my current jobs because I'm kind of like trying to share knowledge with people. And sometimes I have ones where it'd be like, oh no, you don't show me. I want, I'm going to load up my machine. You tell me what I need to type in. And then like it, it is just, even just explaining it to somebody else is a completely different level of knowledge. Or if you're large, you know, it's like, please focus and communicate. So as you know, like this is a different, it's a, it's a different level, right? Yeah. So, uh, I wish I, I wish I'd known more. I don't, you know, now I'm just kind of, uh, it is ridiculous to have some, uh, somebody teaching this for money at this point who ha doesn't have significant industry <laughs> experience, right? <laughs> because you, you know, it's like, well, just, just learn it, right? It's almost like I was just, we, well, we're also providing access to machines and things like that because at this point, everyone doesn't necessarily have a computer at home. Yeah, but I, I don't think that's fair because I still sit around sometimes thinking, why is anybody paying me to learn anything from, like, I think that's normal in a sense. I don't think you're- I pay to learn, I pay to learn from you. So it's like, you know, <laughs> I, I don't ask that question. That's the important part, right? You never, I don't know. I, if, I don't think you ever feel 100% confident. Oh, yeah. Fair enough. I mean, some of the other part, the other part about this is teaching uh, classes that are for enrichment or, for, you know, is one thing or for uh, for professionals. This is almost like it feels a little different when you're literally like people are trying to do this because they want to go to the next job. So very boot campy kind of thing. And of course, even back then, you can't promise anybody anything. No, 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 no. I, I, you, it's not. It's always been that it's been that case for, for decades. Right. It's a, like I can't say. Well, you're going to do this and then you're going to get a job because there's a lot in there. Yeah, but you do move them. You, you move that person forward. And I think if the person's very, very eager, right? I'm sure you had a whole mix of people that were that were really there and focused and others that just dropped out after a week or something like it. It was a mix. It was a mixture of that. Huh? And there was success, that, you know, so failures would be, oh, this person didn't get whatever. And then successes. So this was 2000 would be like people like gut. The one, some of the few tech jobs in the Harrisburg, central Pennsylvania area, and we're suddenly making like 
$55,000. That's a lot of money in 2000 in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. All right. So, so, so I, I take those wins. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you just helped one person, like you, you did what you had to do, like just help one person move forward in their career or support their family or whatever. Like that's all you needed was one, you know? So that's huge. So are you, in, you must be enjoying that work. So what happens now in around 2000 when I ended up getting sick and I head back to Southern California and I sign up for, um, it was supposed to be a quote job. I don't know if it was a, so it's like a contract thing, like a contracting company that's going to teach you X. So here's the a tip of the bubble, but the bubble is starting to pop, right? So you're going to teach you about rational products, clear case, clear quest, source control systems, <clears throat> bug trackers. And then you'll go consult for them. This is largely a, uh, I soon discover after signing the contract, lessons learned, that this is kind of like a scam, visa related scam. Oh. Uh, but the good part was for me, now I have access to like software and I just learned it. And then I got a job um, with that. They sent me out. I was one of their few successful uh, contractors, I guess, as far as like, get you know, uh, getting a placement and I start working, I head back across the country and start working for General Dynamics outside of uh, Boston. That's nice. Yeah. Now you're in, a, you're in a good tech city, a good company, even though you're you're contracting in there. Yeah. Well, here's where the story gets weird. So I, I am, uh, it's like contract to hire, right, through this agency and basically sign out and it's like, I can't quit without having to pay back, quote, training uh, <laughs> for that contract company. For how don't long? Ever sign, don't ever sign, for a year. Don't ever sign those things, people. Never, 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 yeah, never. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, lessons learned. Remember, I'm still pretty young at this point, right? No, 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 no. Like that's life, life is about not making the same mistake twice, right? <laughs> like I make a mistake every day, so it's not... Don't we all? Don't we all? Yeah, so, so, yeah, I'm working in uh, at uh, General Dynamics Communication Systems. So here's where things become like nonlinear. So this is a nice, a nice, fairly high paying uh, salary position. Essentially, they like, you know, that contract company, like, you know, got a cut for placing me there. Right. And they were, you know, kind of thing is how, how it works. Like, and then I had had a, had a salary job, not getting paid by the contract company. I'm just get, I'm getting paid by General Dynamics. Wait, 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 wait. You were a General Dynamics employee, and they got they they got their 20, 25 percent of whatever it was for placing you. And then you're still under a a contract with the old company to have to stay there for a year. Well, uh, uh, in theory, because maybe that company isn't getting paid unless I'm there for a certain amount of time. Right. So you have to at least right, usually three months. <laughs> Stay, just say a year. So yeah, I'm staying there for, uh, I stayed there for <clears throat> over the year. Uh, during that time, 9-11 happens. Mm, 2000, okay. So, so now right, we're in right. 2001. Uh, so I start there, in two, you know, the initial stuff, whatever is in late 2000. I start in General Dynamics early 2001. <clears throat> during the time I'm there, 9-11 uh, happens. You know, big business for a company that makes cruise missiles and tactical network encryptors. So that was the thing. Uh, I had asked to be sent to one of our other locations. They refused to send me because I didn't have a college degree. So they couldn't send me to Okazuna or uh, any place like that. Yeah, um, then I quit and worked as a freelance photojournalist in North Africa and Southwest Asia for the next several years. All right, slow down. Slow, slow, slow down. Slow down. <laughs> it's it's like, like, save, save that as the, the chapter transition, yeah. All right, so you you decided to leave General Dynamics. <laughs> yes. And in this process of you thinking about what you're going to do next before you quit. Right. You're thinking about going to Africa and Asia as a photojournalist. No, I leave because I want to. Uh, I want to go cover the news that's happening. Then, where did this? Where did this idea come from? It must have been brewing in your head. I, I have a lot of ideas all the time, Bill. I don't, you know, I just whatever. I had done writing before I started doing uh, some uh, photography. I think soon before that, um, and uh, yeah, I decided to put the two together. I'd always like languages. And so, yeah, I, I 
self-funded and you know took the took the meager amount of savings I had and was just going going overseas. Right? Amazing. So, tell me how long how long did you do that for? How long were you overseas for then? Uh, on and off for the next three years. Did you were you able to generate any income doing this? Did you were able to AP like did you use these like? My work got published, but I um, I did not was not able to cover my expenses, uh, so I did not do it as long uh, as I would have liked. Right. So, what was your most um, what story did you publish that you were most proud of? I guess at the time that you were out there, most proud of at the time, uh, <clears throat> I was uh, it's in Baghdad in December fourteenth, fifteenth, and so. I have a byline on like uh, some Saudi English na- language newspaper about uh, Saddam Hussein being captured. And at the time, I, was, I mean, it's it's not tremendous, but at the time, I thought it was a pretty cool thing. Were you nervous at all when you're when you were were you out there on your own? Yes. In these in these countries covering this stuff, and you had credentials. We did you have were able to get like official credentials? Oh, I wrote up my own. You just wrote up your own credentials. Yeah. And everybody accepted them. <laughs> they get you out into four out of five uh, Iraqi political headquarters buildings. Sure, at the time, right? That's a long time ago. <laughs> so. Yeah, but I mean, that took guts. Like, you must have had some moments where you were where you thought, "I'm not going to get out of this," or "I'm not going to get back home." Or sure, I don't know. Me, the <clears throat> I'm a different person now than I was then, and then I was not particularly concerned with my safety. We're gonna have to have a whole other conversation about <laughs> some of those stories <laughs> because I mean, at the t- the good the good part or the the things that I remember. What well, I mean, I spent a lot. Of, I was basically working headquartered out of Cairo. I spent over a year um, studying Arabic. I you know terrible at it now, but uh, and and then. Uh, did trips throughout the region, both uh, before and after the kickoff of of that war. Uh, so yeah, amazing. So you, so you finally decide that you you can't fund this anymore. You, you tried for what two or three years. Yeah, yeah. To make this, which puts you at about what two thousand four. It's like two thousand five ish or early two thousand five when I'm kind of like oh, I'm gonna come back. Uh, you know, uh, I need to need to stop. Because what I was doing was like, I'd go overseas for six months. I'd come back, c- couch surf at somewhere for like six to eight weeks, and in the time, I would then like have tech, uh, tech contract jobs for very short times to just get enough money to go back. So oh, one, my my actual trip to Iraq, that very brief, almost dilettantish trip, where I did do, I w- that was funded by sixty hours of ClearQuest consulting. So at this point, it's also like this is getting very valuable to do. Did you have any conversation with your parents about what you were doing for those three years back and forth? I don't know, not much, right? I did have contact with them during the more dangerous parts. I just didn't notify them. So you're coming back to the US and you're you're generating revenue and then you're going back and you come in and it's all consulting. And now what it sounds like is the the money that you can make doing this, what was it, clear? What did you say it was called? Clear? Oh, oh, that was, uh, yeah, just, so just like computer consulting. So the closest thing would be like, imagine if you're, somebody's hiring somebody to be like a consultant for like Jira. Gotcha. Right. Or something like that these days. <laughs> where it's like, yeah, it's not, but you're gonna have to pay somebody who knows about that because like they've they've already done the boring work. But no, I come back and I'm like, I need to, I need to get more more settled, <laughs> right? Because I'm like older now. Basically, I'm now things are getting more and more dangerous for a 30 year old American who's wandering around without much explanation and the ability to speak several languages. It's not like I was working for like a newspaper. Or any, you know, I'd not been successful in that. So it's just like, yeah, uh, yeah, I started working in San Diego for Qualcomm for a while, worked with a friend that sucked. Um, I took another, after that, I took a um, time out for a few weeks and I was doing um, a trip to the Hurricane Rita zone. I did some journalism there, uh, kind of like taking pictures of things, mostly just helping people. <laughs> I was there for a short time, then just help people. I was like, oh, I got some pictures and little less than a story. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. And then just 
took pictures and sent, like, I have a digital camera. I can take pictures for insurance purposes. I finished that up. And then this, uh, I think I took another essentially vacation. It was my last trip to the region and come back. And uh, I'm in LA and decided to move to Silicon Valley as it had jobs that weren't in the finance, insurance, real estate sector, which was the case in LA in the time. This is like 2006. So you decide you're moving to basically Silicon Valley. Do you have a place to stay when you do that? Or you already, you already acquire a job before you go out there? I came up and was uh, staying in the Howard Johnson's in downtown San Jose, which was my first trip to San Jose. Um, and uh, I had set up an interview or two before I came. So I'm just there like, let me just go. And of course, now I've lived essentially out of a backpack for the last, most of the last uh, four plus years, five years. And so like this, this kind of mobility is not anything new for me at that point. Just go. Uh, yeah, I think I had a really cruddy interview at Cisco, but um, I had an interview for an IBM contract. And basically I was like, yep, I'm here for another day or two. I came in, uh, did well in the interview and then, you know, just grabbed my stuff and, and moved up for that, that contract job uh, at the I IBM's castle. Uh, overlooking South San Jose, if anyone has, I don't know if any, if, yeah, so if you've been there, it's a, there's a beautiful campus on Santa Teresa that is like an IBM amazing headquarters building that has things like original hard drive platters, and it looks like a museum inside. It's like a research facility. And so, uh, yeah, I was doing that for, geez, I made, met some people very short time um, consulting there. And then just kind of kicked it for the rest of the summer after I get an apartment in San Jose while uh, Google finished their interview process. So you're, you're lacking of a four-year university degree at this point. Isn't even a question anymore to any of these employers? It really isn't because uh, throughout my career in software, I've largely done the plumbing, right? These are not glorious, I wrote this kind of jobs. This is like, we need people to focus on whatever, like a bug tracking system or source control or releasing things or making sure that stuff's still running. And so um, they are more interested in, as far as I've seen for all these positions throughout my career, more interested in that you can do it as instead of like how you learned it. So then you decide to apply to Google, which must have taken, how many months did it take for you from beginning to end to get that job? Because I hear horror stories. Yeah, it, I mean, it wasn't so much, it took me six weeks to get that job. That's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I hear people go, go months trying to get jobs over there. They do, actually, especially out of college, right? Um, they usually have a very lengthy process. The shortest I've heard of somebody on my team was, I think they, they had a two or three week process. So my six weeks was nothing. Right. <laughs> I met some some good people there. I was uh, I think uh, Chuck Rossi, who's also, um, you know, a release engineer of some fame. I later worked with him at Facebook, took pity on me. I showed up and the only shoes I had were my traveling boots. So he just thought I was a crazy person and that I, he should cut me a break. Were you excited about getting a job at Google? I mean, I, I think yeah. that, that must have been <laughs> yeah, like, course. wow, I'm working at Google. This is this is I've, I've reached. This was the first of my positions that I had in a in a positive sense, where it was like my parents had heard of the company, <laughs> right? So it was like, oh, Google, yeah, kind of thing. And and um, this was post IPO, but like still very early Google, right? This is uh, now it's gone through three or four different culture changes and management changes, all this other stuff. I mean, that's a, a larger story, but yeah, Google in two thousand six is like the height of its creation as a. Uh, primary colored gifted program for superannuated adolescents, right? So it's like, just like, oh, wow, this is almost an extension of a Stanford campus without the fancy buildings. Um, this is when it's still the core, core four buildings in Mountain View, the old um, SGI campus. Uh, and, and like everyone works in these four buildings and then it starts expanding out. Now, of course, it's like eaten half of Mountain View. And you're doing the same kind of work over there? You're just supporting software and system? Release engineering. Tell me what release engineering means and like. <sighs> Ooh. So there's been a lot of improvement on this, of course, over the last 15 years. The technology has matured. But this is a lot of stuff where it's like, geez, I'm trying to think of some technology that that comes in at Google at this time. So 
My first project is assisting the conversion of their ads backend infrastructure to Borg. So this is the beginning of a launch of what now people know as Kubernetes, right? Before then, it was running on a system called Babysitter, which is just like basically a series of cron jobs that are, you know, making sure that serving, you know, it's running on racks somewhere and that it's still running somewhere. We're built, do, are we don't, um, Google at that time, 2006, is still building its distributed build system. And most of this code is in C, I'd say, maybe some Java. And so this is the painful time that produces the impetus to create Go. When you have to download massive amount, massive tool chain, massive amount of dependency, and then spend over an hour watching it grind away on a very powerful desktop or series of desktops just to produce object files. This is where it's like, whoo, this is broken and we can't scale it. And so you start having these larger Google like, so for Bazel, for instance, is Blaze just re, you know, so they have the beginning of these object reuse and distributed build systems in, rolled out internally there. <clears throat> the modification of Perforce until it becomes like a Piper. And, and it's kind of like scaling up, but doing it in a way where it's like, you know, this is the kind of stuff that hadn't been seen before. And now we kind of take it for granted that, you know, the idea would be like, well, what are you going to do if you need to uh, support thousands of engineers working on overlapping projects at the same time that are shipping all the time? You're right there in the beginning of all of this yeah. distributed, you know, computing systems, right? Like, got to get that installed, got to get that running, got to keep running. You're right at the beginning of all that. Yeah, and I'm also there, like, I was on the uh, the Ruth Engineer rotation for Google Web Service. So when you go to Google.com, GWIS is what you see. And so this is also the beginning of stuff where, you know, those interview questions really huh, were based on real things like, well, what do you do when you want to deploy something to 20,000 server nodes? Yeah. And now also, unless they've read the white paper, people from outside the company don't know that Borg exists. Right. I mean, Google didn't even talk about that up until a couple of years ago, I think. Well, it's probably a little longer than that. But like, yeah, it's, it's just it's in the ground floor watching that. I just wish I don't know. I wish I had been in a um, happier place myself so I could have taken more advantage of it. But it was like um it was cool. That was definitely the vibe where it was like, there were a lot of people to learn from. We're doing things that are like, you know, kind of spreading all through the world. And you have these, you know, even a, even an unsuccessful product has like 15 million users, right? This, this is huge stuff. And doing it where it's like on a campus. I, I have a photo that I took that's uh, uh, someone breaking over a pinata, open a pinata during a, uh, party like a uh, product launch party and that was the google experience for me at that time it was just like it's it's just fun there's a whole bunch of excited people just like boom and all the goodies come out it's wonderful there's no better education at the time too for this kind of stuff and which where you are the, the only better education i think of is you were sitting as a stanford computer science student interning at Google at the time. And then you'd be like, okay, I know how it works. Now give me some money. I'm going to start my own company. So how long are you at Google then? How long are you doing this job? You started there 2006, you said, right? So Yeah, I'm, I'm at Google for, uh, huh, my total time at Google is about five and a half years, but it's broken up because in the middle of it, I go to Facebook. So you leave Google like around what, I guess 2007, eight or something. And then yeah, I'll, I'll go to like 2009, I take a little bit of time off to do some traveling. And then uh, 2010, I start working at Facebook. What was it that attracted you to go to Facebook? Just the same kind of problems? Same, same kind of problems. Uh, the opportunity to work with a friend. Um, so Chuck Rossi was, had been the sole release engineer at Facebook for two years. It was time for him to get some help. I think uh, there was a Facebook post at the time. The day I interviewed at Facebook, there was a post because Chuck had fallen asleep in his chair. And I was like, I think I got a, I got a leg up on this one. <laughs> the job is enough where it's literally, uh, you know, going to kill this man. So uh, I think he needs some help. And uh, yeah, so yeah. So pre-IPO Facebook. Exciting. And how long did you stay at Facebook? Just a couple of years then? Uh, just a couple of years, yeah. Uh, I wish I had been a uh, more stable and smarter individual so that I could be retired right now. Um, but, <laughs> you know, 
We go with what we can. You know, none of that's ever promised. So I, I you know, that's not, you know, it's not fair. But then you go back to Google. So, so I'm at Facebook. Facebook is at the time. So this is 20, 2010 to 2011. Facebook is the, probably the best place in the world to be a software engineer at the time. By that, I mean that you could join, whether you're an intern, whether you're a new grad, whether you're coming in as a seasoned professional, you go through their internal boot camp because they were breaking apart a hiring co- cartel by Google and Apple and Intel and all that, you know, the, remember that lawsuit, all right? I got a couple grand from that, should have been 10 times as much, but um, they have to find talent and developers wherever they can, right? They're scouring uh, message boards about uh, programming at the time to find people who have intelligent comments and offer them an interview, right? They just have to break because they can't, they're, they're, there's a cartel, right? Um, and uh, so um, people are coming in, they're able to ship software to 500 plus million people and their mom within a couple weeks. Unheard of. We're shipping daily and often multiple times a day, the slowest that you would write code and have it be in production at Facebook at that time is one week. Yeah, and it's going in once again. It's like, oh yeah, I just added this to feature to photos. I just look at this, yeah, and your family is using it. It was pretty impressive at the time, right? So best place to be a software engineer, worst place to be the adult supervision slash release engineer. <laughs> I'm working 70, 65, 70 hours a week. Um, I had a time where it was like, the Simpsons line, like, can't sleep, clowns will eat me. Like, because I would go to bed, things would be okay. I wake up at 7 a.m. and then just look at all the pages and all the things that were broken and have to run back into the office. Yeah, because you're not, somebody else is breaking it. And your job is to report, get the right developer involved. And Sometimes it's to fix it, but it's also like a large, it was, we had, we had to keep state through like logs. I had the, uh, the one downvote button at Facebook exists as part of the uh, Release Engineering Council. And there was one at the time where we had to keep track of of, of downvotes uh, because we were keeping a state between like developers who weren't paying attention. So we had a grudge system, essentially, <laughs> so that we knew when somebody burned us. Wow. Wow. And I don't, I don't mean burned us in terms of like, oh, you caused a bug and it was a rollback. That happens every day. That's normal. It's more like, you launched software and then went to a party at Antonio's nut house down the street <laughs> and you're gone and we can't reach you and the site is on fire. It's more of a question of like judgment and dereliction were ones where we were just kind of like, listen, and it wasn't, you were banned forever, but there were people who were like, they were no longer allowed to submit bug fixes by themselves. <laughs> so, wow. so I guess, I guess, I mean, after a year or two, you're, you're going to be burned out in that kind of environment. Toast. Completely burned. Completely just worked over. I could skip the details, but yeah, I, go, I w- then worked for a startup for about uh, five months called Airtime. Uh, that was like a rock star play. The two, two of the uh, uh, big names in that, co-founders or, or you know, let's say it's big names, Sean Fanning and Sean Parker, it would have been more profitable and useful for us to put cameras on the wall and just videotape it, right? It would have been a show like Silicon Valley ahead of its time. Uh, that was nutty. You know, we had like MC Hammer drop by for an alpha product launch. <laughs> oh my before. God. Right? Yeah, after Paul, Paul Walker, like he shared a chiropractor with Sean Fanning and showed up at a party. I was like, what? Who is that? What is that? <laughs> like Paul Walker. What? We were, just, we were just like confused, right? We're just trying to write it like, like a, uh, a video chat product, I'm um, sure now been replaced. If it, you know, imagine like uh, the chat, whatever, so Megley without porn, right? It doesn't, I don't know. It is a lot. There was a lack of product market fit. Let me put it that way. Um, and I leave that after a few months, return to Google for the next few years, work in a startup, the startup doesn't work out. I leave that. I remember having questions about like, well, you're only there for five months. Can you explain this during my Google interview? And I was like, you know, they, well, I didn't get fired. You know, they, they were messing with people's lives. There was like a lot of VC drama. And I was justified because like, um, I think three weeks after I start the job, CNN Money has an article by Om Malik saying, airtime is the new color. They need to give back their $33 million in my <laughs> So I, I moved from uh, malcontent to visionary within a matter of weeks, which is um, nice. Uh, something that's been repeated frequently in my life. So you're back at Google. How much longer do you stay there? For uh, it's uh, another three years. 
Yeah. So now it's like 2015. So over the la next six years, are you still kind of looking for that next place to stay? Are you bouncing around? Like, what's what's happening? It's a complicated story. I don't know. I'm going to think about this for a second. I do I do several other positions. Um, you know, I have my current one. I worked at Microsoft uh, at the time, so I'm doing my you know my Fang trading card collection uh, expands. Right. And I also took a ton of time off. Uh, I just needed to uh, reset for a lot of a lot of personal reasons. Um, almost had like a second adolescence. <laughs> so uh, I enjoyed that. Just, just a lot of things going on. It's amazing. Like you, you, your your career took you to Google, took you to Facebook, it took you to Microsoft. Right. These are, Amazon's the only other big shop in my head that you haven't you haven't been at yet. I haven't worked. Uh, I, and I've talked to these places, but I haven't worked at Amazon, Apple, or Netflix. I mean, I'm not really collecting trading cards. There's not a next on the list kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, I've, I've worked at a lot of story. Big, two of the companies that I've worked at, I've had movies made about them. I got to watch The Social Network in a uh, Facebook private showing with like Zuck in the in the theater, right? So yeah. Yeah, very cool stuff. I don't know. It's, it's kind of like this uh, little, I think it's a little, little, uh, you know, Zelig slash Forrest Gump style. I'm like, why? I don't, you know, just somehow wandering through this, but yeah. But I, I love the story because it, it was your, your knowledge and your eventual, you know, your experience and all that, that, that got you here, right? Like it wasn't a formal education. It was, you know, I'm interested in this. I'm going to learn it. And every job led. And I, I think you were in some cases in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Too, right? Which helps. Did, and you never seemed to have hesitated to apply for the jobs you wanted, whether you thought you were qualified or not. Is that kind of true? I don't think it was that as intentional as that. Um, I certainly just, it was more just like, I'm just going to try. Yeah. Um, a lot of these things, it's also... My, me getting my first job at Google was essentially an open source intelligence problem. At that time, Google wanted people who were not only technologists, but were interesting. I don't really, you know, so it was like more of a quote culture kind of thing, different, much different Google culture than it is now. And so I did things like, you know, there was not, I knew, was new to the Valley. It wasn't like I could fall back on a whole bunch of networking. So instead, I had things like I wrote a blog about my journeys and I shared a whole bunch of my photography and I put that on my resume or put it on email or something like that. And I was surprised where several of the interviewers actually looked at it. Right. So they were like, oh, this is an interesting person. Like she's she's got something going on. This is this is neat. Um, and uh, gave us something else to talk about, as well as also, you know, doing the OK, go write some Python for me on the board. Well, I think it's an, if I had seen that in a resume, I would have said, this is somebody who's really impressive. I want to talk to them because I don't think anybody can just get on a plane and go do the things that you were doing. Like it takes a, a level of, I don't know, I, I want to say confidence, even though you were probably, I would have been scared out of my mind. It takes a level of confidence. I want people with that level of confidence on my team. My boss, that uh, after I had been successfully working there for a year, right? So now it's like I'm performing well. And I get like uh, the first like exceeds expectations kind of uh, performance review at Google uh, for my, you know, uh, first, of, first of, of many there, fortunately, right? And, um, but he was looking and he used to, he's looking at resumes from people that were hired and try to figure out like what, what signal was in the resume that would say that they were going to be successful. And he was like, you have an unimpressive resume. I don't understand how you're able to do what you're able to do. Like, I missed, uh, I mistook this like consulting thing where you said nationwide for the nationwide insurance company and you know, all this kind of things. And I was like, listen, I was, Anthony, I was like, Anthony, it's there, but you don't necessarily know how to read it. When the bottom section says, Unilateral freelance jur uh, photojournalist, Southwest Asia, North Africa, 2002 to 2005. That was not tourism. Right. And so as it's like, it's there. I don't know if these things are important or not, but like, that's how I view my, my resume at the time. This is something that I don't like. It's a, just an aside at this point, because my, my tech pedigree is just ridiculous at this point. Yeah. Like, I think it's there, but I don't think a lot of people would have like clicked to that any kind of. Not even like some random personal quality. It's literally like I did that stuff. All right, we got twelve 
minutes left, 10, 12, 11 minutes. Um, if anybody's watching the YouTube video, you're going to see a bunch of swords behind Sarah. And it is something that's been, I've been wanting to ask her since we yeah, started. I think sword. now is the time. Yeah. So the time. You're, you're ready for a like 15th century like war right now, aren't you? Like you're ready to go on a crusade. What's going on? <laughs> <here>? <laughs> no crusades. Thanks. <laughs> So, yeah, what's the story with the swords I have behind me? Uh, so, yes, it, here's, here's my, uh, like, so, um, excitement. Just, just for the, the people listening, how long is that? This looks like something out of King Arthur's court. So just describe yeah, so, that sword. So for those, for those listening, uh, I am currently holding a training, essentially a bastard sword from uh, a company called Albion. And so how long is the, the blade of this sword is about 90, 90, excuse me, 90 to 92 centimeters. Uh, the total length, like it, it, uh, from floor to the tip of the pommel ends, I think just uh, just uh, around my navel, right? So this is definitely a bastard one. Is that like four feet? That looks almost four feet tall. Is it three feet or three feet maybe? It's a good three feet, yeah. And how heavy is that sword? Because it... Uh, it weighs, uh, it weighs uh, I would say American terms, like it, it's, it's three and a half pounds, right? I just smacked it against my desk. There we go. So okay. yeah, um, and this is a blunt. It's a, this is a blunt <laughs> training sword. I have sharps, but this is this is a blunt. This is the stuff that I would use, and uh, whether it's like training, doing drills, or uh, doing uh, free play and light sparring, this is the kind of. Sword. Okay, are you wearing armor at any level when you're playing with these swords? Because I think they would still break a rib. <laughs> when I'm doing lights, yeah, it's like you're wearing. Um, Let's say I'm doing drills that involve people close. You're know, wearing wearing a fencing mask, right? Um, oh, I have. I think I have not my fencing mask, but a fencing mask here. So I can. I'll hold it, that up first for YouTube people and say. Anyway, I'm, I'm currently holding a normal fencing mask, right? So that that would protect against some things. When people do boo hurt or other things where it's like they're definitely just beating the hell out of each other, they wear heavy armor i have like a heavy armor helmet you can barely see out of it it weighs like 12 pounds um but i don't use that <laughs> what about for your hands because i played a lot of hockey and if i wasn't wearing gloves it was it was rough and now you're playing with three pound swords so yeah so playing with swords um yeah good question so um light stuff i can just wear uh lightly padded gloves or, or just leather work gloves uh when we're not moving fast um because the cross guard or the key in uh, protects your hands if you're using the sword correctly. For stuff where it's like moving fast, I'm afraid I'm gonna get a finger broken, I have full out, full out like steel gauntlets. What's the worst injury you've had working, playing with the, I don't, I, what's the right word? I don't wanna say playing because you, this is beyond that, but. Let's like, say, let's say playing, it's okay, that's all right. So when, when, you're, when you're using these swords, so it's like, what's the worst injury you've, you've ever had? So I've had a series of nasty bruises. I think at one point I was trying to do like, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, white belt, and longsword at the same time, and both my arms were just covered with bruises. And I didn't even know. I was just like, it's just the collection. I didn't even know. So I've had some some good bruises, especially from uh, thrusts. I had, um, ooh, like thrusts to the abdomen or something like that, even with padding, can sometimes leave like some nasty marks. Um, in terms of things that take me out of training, like uh, shoulder injuries from like o overuse injuries, essentially the same way that you would get in like weightlifting or something. It's just a repetitive motion done the wrong way. And I've had that like, oh, I can't, I can't pick up a sword for six weeks because this has to heal. It is possible to get, like I've had friends who have had like fingers broken, uh, known people who have been concussed and things like that. It, it's possible to get hurt, but like, hmm. Certainly not drawing sharps on other people because you don't want to like kill people. But yeah, you, you you can get hurt, but that's not the goal, right? I, I like I like um, Guy Windsor's description as like we start the we start the session in better health than we ended it, right? And that's that's what I'm trying to do. But is there is there like a um, an organization there? Is it a business? Like where are you? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so I train at uh, Davin Reich European Martial Arts with Stephen Fick. Uh, he has a school in Santa Clara, California. Um, and he's been doing this for, geez, uh, I think he started in a garage maybe 30 years ago, right? Been doing it for a long time. Um, and, uh, he also was on the, like, Ren is, Ren, I would say, like, Ren Fair slash performing circuit. Like, he is, uh, he fought for 
20, you know, so imagine like getting fully armored and fighting for, uh, geez, probably a couple decades. Like, he knows what he's doing. At the Renaissance fairs, at the Renaissance fairs or like, in... yeah, and like or like travel, you know, tra- there, there's, there, there's a lot of ways that people do this kind of stuff, but like, yeah, doing entertaining fights. Um, you know, I don't think he worked at medieval times, but that kind of stuff, right. Doing these, um, you know, or SCA and things like that. I also don't know if he had done that, but like, yeah, he, 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 he has armor suits of armor from his former performances and things like that around the place. But so now I want to know when you got involved in this and how. Sure. I started this in 2017, uh, the beginning of 2017 as a way to like get some exercise. And I had looked at it maybe a decade before. <clears throat> and I looked at it and then I went, oh my goodness, those people are still open, which one would not expect from such a weird hobby. And I went down for a um, introductory weekend workshop <clears throat> and I was just like, I was thrilled. I was like, oh, this is something I want to do. Of course, you start out and you are terrible at it. You can barely move. The sword is like this kind of ah kind of thing. <laughs> it only it only weighs so much. The real swords would you know wait, but when you have to like okay, I'm gonna hold it out. Like you gotta pull up those muscles to yeah. just be able to like yep, I this is not a big deal, no big de- you know, or in two hands or things like that. So yeah, you 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 must grow around it, <laughs> right? And so this was a good thing. And there's a lot of. <laughs> The mastery of this is to be able to do fine muscle movements because there's differences in things where it's like being, you know, just literally being able to like push your thumb to reverse the edge of a sword. <clears throat> and you need to be able to do that under stress because somebody else is swinging a sword at you. So when you go to class, though, I, I imagine you've got a pretty nice case for these swords. You're not walking down the street with your sword on your shoulder. <laughs> I have, I use a, a golf, a hard side golf case and I just fill it up with swords and equipment and I have traveled with that, uh, even like flown places with it. Yeah. I, I don't, I try not to walk around just with a sword. Yeah. It's, it's, it's <laughs> as much as I would like to, like I have one that has a scabbard and things like that, but I'm like, yeah, you know, let's not do that. Let's not do that. Do you plan or maybe you have already to you know, perform in, in one of some of these fairs and I have not I have not done that. I'm not <clears throat> not something of course, especially the pandemic, it's not something that I'm chasing. But the only performance I've done is I've jo- joined Stephen and Johnny and we were uh <clears throat> it, he was doing an explanation as well as some we were doing some bites in front of uh middle school kids at the end of a school year, which I, was like lovely. I mean one, they're middle school kids, so they have it's just all wise cracks, right? But um, I thought it was a blast. I had a good day. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you told him a thousand times, don't go home and start beating each other with swords. <laughs> uh, one, you have to have the sword. Because <laughs> yeah. they're not going to listen. Well, <laughs> um, I, I certainly, I, I don't think that any kid is oblivious to the idea that you can hit somebody with a stick. Right? <laughs> and they're also not oblivious that things like sticks hurt. Right? So this, there's, you know... They could do that, but like sticks hurt, right? And people know that. I don't. I don't know. I don't think. I don't think it's something you really need to explain too much uh, to people. I just. I just remember how dumb we were when we were like sure. middle school. We we all we all had BB guns, and we would put pillows all around our bodies, wear maybe some like plastic work goggles, and go out into the woods and shoot each other with BBs. And, you know, and I'm just like, if you showed up and I was middle school, all we would think about was. We've got to make some swords and fight now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> there, 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 one, I think some of the things that uh, maybe I don't even know if it's middle school, but there's yeah, may, maybe there's also they have like a dragon slayers program where like kids come in and they learn some of the basics, but they're doing it with like foam swords, right? And they even have they have a particular like they figured out a way to do this with foam swords and noodles where. If the kids like whip it too much, it does it bends. Like it prevents you from just like winding up and beating the hell out of some other kid. So they, they got that going. For for the for the for the adult, it's more of like uh, there's mutual respect. At some points, I've had you know you need a um a par a parody and threat. I've had people like doing drills, and I've told them like take off. They had a lot of protection on. I'm like take that off. I need you to be more afraid of me. You know. Yeah, and so that that's a you, there's there's a social contract that it's possible to like set up a safe training environment 
um, where you're not worried about uh, adults beating the hell out of people. Because also this is like largely, it's Silicon Valley, so a lot of people coming in are like, nerds, this is a nerd's hobby, right? Like, yeah, you you know, you got swords and you're like, yeah, great, it's like Game of Thrones. And, you know, I have, um, I have one of these here, I put this, you know, it's like, oh, I'm gonna look through uh, a translation of a, uh, you know, 1409 Italian manuscript to learn like how I'm supposed to be punching somebody or some, you know, hit them with a dagger. Uh, so ultimate nerd hobby, you know, it's not a an MMA gym where people are like 21 and be like, what are you going to do with your life? Like, I'm fighting people, right? We don't have that. It's like a bunch of, bunch of like largely people in their 30s and 40s. Um, there's people, uh, I train with people into, uh, geez, like 68, 70, who are interested in doing it for a lot of different reasons. But almost no one is there is like, there ain't, there's no money in it. So no one's there to fight. But I love that. Parity in threat. Okay, I got to write that down. I love that term. Parity and threat. Like, I got to figure out how to use that somewhere. <laughs> well, good, good luck. I mean, so an example is I don't, I don't have them here. Yeah, sadly. But my, my oh, I'm worried about getting hurt gauntlets are, are full steel gauntlets. And so I've had this where it's like, and then people are like, oh, this and that. And I'm like, oh, I'm not worried. I'm sitting here wearing steel boxing gloves. Yeah. This is a larger discussion. People, when you're doing these kind of sports, people get adrenalized, right? And guys get adrenalized very quickly. It goes up and down, right? It's like kind of a bi biological thing. Women, it's like, well, kind of like going to go, takes a while. And then it's like, beep, you know, uh, it's up for a while. So when you adrenalize, you lose some control or you start getting more like fighty. And that's something that, yeah, you, you have to control and Aggressive, also sometimes yeah. go, oh, I'm not feeling good. We got to stop this. Or it's like, hey, you know what? We're not going to play this way. I'm a giant Amazon. <laughs> So, like, um, some of the things where people have gotten used to adrenalizing and somewhat bullying, like, I can stop that. A, because I can defend myself, but B, it's like, I'm a big lady. <laughs> and so it's like, um, I think I had somebody who did that, and then they were going to try to wrestle, or they were doing something else, and I, um, I ended up throwing them, right? I just grabbed their sword and just dragged them by it, and, looked, like, watched them go past me. And my instructor's like... Don't do that with her. <laughs> She'll mess you up. <laughs> All right. We are, we are out of time. And I, I, I can't thank you enough for spending uh, this time with us telling us about your story. The story is amazing. I love the success you found in just moving forward every day. And, and uh, I, I think it's definitely going to help some people who hear it. I, I, you know, I hope so. I hope it was interesting. Um, you know, some of it is it, in a narrative form. It sounds like it makes sense. Of course, our lives are more chaotic than that, right? There's a lot of things that are dependent upon chance and whim. Uh, and there's a lot of things that are just like, I like learning. Com computers are a pretty good uh, outlet for that. And then also, as I said, like, the world I dreamed about when I read Neuromancer at 16 is like here. I can look, you know, I didn't grow up with like having access to a lot of these things. And now it's all available for free, right? Whether it's cheap computation, um, you know, being able to learn almost anything for free, uh, watching YouTube videos about foreign languages, uh, getting things on a Kindle for a dollar. There's a lot of bad stuff, but there's a lot of good stuff too. Things have really changed during uh, both of our lifetimes. All right. So if people want to get in touch with you after listening, we'll have stuff in the show notes. But how, what's the best way for people to reach out and uh, say hi? Oh, geez. I, I don't know. I think I, ha I have a Twitter handle that's like Sarah Maeve one I have to give you the link because I don't know if a lot of people can spell Maeve. <laughs> but um, that's probably the best way to interact with me on a, on a light basis. All right, right. Perfect. perfect. So, um, also... If I can mention yeah. one more thing, um, I believe uh, you 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 have met John Doak, who works at Microsoft. Oh, oh yes, yes, I did. I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, John Doak and David Justice, uh, who are both at Microsoft, and I are writing a title t TBD, but it's uh, going to be Go for DevOps, coming from Packet. Oh, and nice. So I I am uh, assisting in general as well as also i'm going to be focused on the release engineering and related operation you know how, how one might use go for some operational tasks that i think are useful and of course john um and david have both been doing like heavy duty 
here's Go, here's how Kubernetes interaction, things like that. So that will be coming at some point. I will, I will let you know. <laughs> yeah, let me know. I'd love to get a, I, I, I'll spend time uh, reading that too, if you need any reviews. Well, I will, uh, I appreciate that. I will pass that on as a, you know, because they were asked like, well, who would review this kind of thing? So I'm happy that we got me. to Me. I also, <laughs> the copy of your book is coming tomorrow and I'm looking forward to the Go Notebook. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, for that. That's brilliant. All right, we are really out of time now. So I want to thank Sarah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. I have to go to a stand-up and, feel, and see what's broken. <laughs> so this is Bill Kennedy with the OnLabs podcast. Thank you for spending time listening to Sarah and I, and we'll hope to see you back here real soon.